My name is Rob Yagno. Uh, I'm probably best known for a puzzle game called Cogs that I released a couple years ago. Uh, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Today I'm going to talk about our new game called Extra Solar. So Extra Solar is a little bit of a different project. And I'm going to go pretty fast here because I've got, I got 30 minutes to cover a lot of material. So we're going to go boom, boom, boom. Uh, Extra Solar is a, a pretty unusual project. Uh, it really blurs the line between fantasy and reality. This is actually a screenshot from Extra Solar. But then don't be... Don't think, wow, that's amazing graphics, because all you get is a screenshot. We only render one image every six hours. So it's a pretty unusual game. The way that it works is that there's this sort of, there's this very rich fiction behind Extrasolar that says uh, we have launched, like the scientific agency called the Exoplanetary Research Institute has launched a probe to an extrasolar planet in the habitable zone where there might be life. So we're going to put a bunch of rovers down there. We have like dozens and dozens of rovers, and we're going to crowdsource exploration. So you as an individual can apply to come in and drive a rover around the planet. Uh, you, you know, using this Google Maps interface and taking photos, like a photo every six hours, and uh, explore this planet one photo at a time. So, so once again, this is, you know, we really try to make this look like a legitimate scientific mission. The fiction is very rich and very deep around this. The gameplay is all very consistent with the fiction. Um, and yet, it is surprising to me that this is the first question that I get asked when I pitch this to audience. How do the rovers kill each other? And this just blows my mind. I mean, what do they think our, like, NASA is doing out there? So, I, you know, I kept getting this question over and over, and I finally started to think about, like, where, where is this coming from? And I realized that we all have built up in our heads this, this large database of assumptions about what a game is supposed to be. Uh, you know, this, this, uh, this database of assumptions is built up over a lifetime of playing games and designing games. And, and this is really important. I mean, this is our toolbox. This, these are the notions that we draw from when we create new games. But what we need to realize is that sometimes this does box us in. And we, like, we have such rigid assumptions about what a game is supposed to be that when it comes time to genuinely innovate, we have trouble moving outside of this box. But what's important to realize is that we made this box. It's ours. And if we want to, we can destroy it. And in fact, I think that some of the people in this room might say it is our responsibility to destroy this box, or at least reshape it and expand the notion of what our tool set as designers is supposed to be. So um, you know, lots of other artistic media have broken the rules over, over time. Um, and and when, these, when these rules are broken, you know, the way that free verse broke the rules of poetry, stream of consciousness broke the rules of literature, surrealism broke the rules of painting, jazz broke the rules of music, and at the time it was always very controversial. But, you know, you move on and pretty soon these just get accepted as tools in those artistic forms. I think sometimes what we forget is that as designers in the game industry, we sort of feel like we're engineers, you know, we're working with computers, we're doing programming, and we forget that we're an artistic medium also. So we need to be asking ourselves, Who's going to break the rules of game development to allow our industry to grow? So I don't want to say that innovation isn't happening. The innovation is def definitely happening in our industry. But I want to talk a little about where I personally see it happening. There's a lot of in innovation in monetization. You have your microtransactions, and your free-to-play, and your embedded duds, and your pay-to-play, and your product placement, and your subscription, and all sorts of things that start to kind of maybe border on you know, being ethically questionable. Um, and there, you know, there are new monetization methods that come out every month. Um, we have innovation in promotion. So I took this quote from a website. I won't say who, but it says, our company promotes iPhone and iPad applications to put them in the top 25 in three days. Now, I want you to notice what it's not saying. What it's not saying here is that your application needs to have a certain quality level. All that you need to have is a certain amount of dollars in the bank, and you can pay to have things like click bot farms and paper installs and click exchanges to get your app promoted. And as indie developers, which I think is a large proportion of the people in this room, that's very hard to do because we don't have a million dollars to spare on marketing. So you know, the, the lesson here is that for the big companies, no quality is necessary if you want the visibility you need to sell your app. So how about innovation and gameplay? What's going on here? Well, I mean, based on what you've already seen in the previous section, the sort of what the big studios are doing is cloning what works, paying to outpromote the competitors, it's simple and effective, and it works every time. So the problem here, I and mean, part of the challenge, is that game mechanics cannot be copywritten. You can patent them, but it's very expensive and hard to do, and I would, I would ask you, you know, preferably not to do that. Um, you can certainly copyright other things, but the mechanics, it is legal to, copy, to, to clone these things and just put out a similar game. So indies are stuck in this catch-22. We innovate, and we get cloned. We fail to innovate, and we just blend in with everybody else. So, you know, this is our indie first world problem. What's an indie to do? There's good news, though. 
the fact that the big players have shown very little interest in innovation leaves a lot of room for us. There's a lot of room to, for us to make changes and make big waves in the process. So a couple solutions. One is to innovate in form. As I said, mechanics cannot be copywritten, but form can. So when you innovate, innovate in your aesthetics. Add story, add audio that's interesting, you know, really go out to get a talented audio artist. Really build up a fiction around your characters and your fictional world. These things are, are protected by copyright, and they're also hard to do. Doing these things well takes time, but a good creative person can make it happen. Just one person. It doesn't take a big studio to make these things happen. So, so innovate in form, very hard to emulate. Solution number two, go crazy. I love this, this uh, quote from computing pioneer Howard Aiken, who worked on the Harvard Mark I computer. He said, don't worry about people stealing your good ideas. If your ideas are any good, you'll have to ram them down people's throats. And there's a lot of truth to this. Just like in other art forms where you know, jazz really pushed the boundaries of music, and everybody said, you know, this is the devil's music. This is not music anymore. This, we, we can't tolerate this. Like, it takes a little while, but if you, you, know, if you ram those, those ideas down people's throats for long enough, they just become part of the, part of the environment. environment. So, you know, I want to talk a little bit about what your highest design principle is. Um, and I think for a lot of people, that design principle is monetization, and especially for big studios. But what's important to understand is that when monetization is your number one design principle, first of all, you're limiting your design space. You're basically saying, not only am I going to operate in this, this small box, this tool set that we listed previously, but we're going to operate in a little small subset of that, and then use some A-B testing to do a little bit of hill climbing to kind of find a local maximum within this space. Um, you're also competing in a space that everybody else is competing with. I mean, how many startups are there are, are just in this room who, who are, you know, basically trying to compete in the same clone space that everybody else is doing? And I don't want to call everyone's game a clone, but like, we're kind of all competing for the same audience in the same space, in the same, you know, coding in the same languages for the same platforms. Um, so when you're when you're designing with monetization, you're really limiting that space. Um, you know, the other thing is that clones tend to win out in this space with advertising. So unless you have a million dollars to spare, uh, it's going to be, you know, it's really hard to compete in that space. And finally, it's just an unsatisfying design process. Like when your design process is sort of like take this other thing, clone it, and try to make it a little bit better, it's just not very, very satisfying. So, so let's instead focus on our de highest design principle, just being creating a great player experience. And it, it doesn't have to be an innovative experience, but just a great player experience. So just by focusing on that, you're leaving yourself a lot more room for innovation. You also end up with a much more passionate team about the product that you're producing because you have something that you really believe in, something with a lot more space to maneuver, and this ultimately results in a better product. Uh, keep in mind also that we're driven by a market of first movers. You know, it's like Minecraft was the first game out there to really do something unique in its particular area, and you know, a lot of clones have attempted to come in since then, but Minecraft is that first mover, is basically the one making all the money. So monetization, of course, still matters. Your A-B testing and your, um, you know, all, all your little tips and tricks for marketing, those are still extremely important. Just don't make the, them your number one design criterion. Okay, so a little bit of an extra, uh, a little bit of a disclaimer here. I'm going to talk a little bit about how Extra Solar has motivated my team to break the rules, but Extra Solar is not out yet, and it may suck. So, you know, don't take all these rules and apply them exactly to a T, and then you know a year later be like, as it turns out, your game sucked, and now mine does too. Uh, so. so What's important, though, is that my team is having a really fun time working on this game, and we think that it's very promising. So a little bit of the inspiration behind Extra Solar. I am a graphics guy, so graphics is kind of the thing that I really want to work with. I really wanted to bring super high-quality imagery to the web, but to do that, I was like, well, I really need to have a GPU in the cloud to make that happen, and I can't afford to, to like stream frame by frame real time like OnLive does. I can't afford to host like basically, basically one GPU in the cloud for every customer that I have. So what are we going to do? And the idea that came out of this was rover-based planetary exploration, where we can take 10 or 20 seconds to render one frame in the cloud. We have to have a renderer that works on one piece of hardware. It doesn't have to be optimized. So a little tiny indie team could potentially do that. So that's kind of where I'm coming from here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little about why we're breaking the, the rules of social games. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little later why I'm, I'm using social games as kind of the framework here. Um, but what, when I do say we're breaking the rules of social games, I, I want it to say that these rules do exist for good reasons. Um, so we need to break them for good reasons. We need to, what's important is that we don't just apply the rules of social games blindly. We consider why those rules exist 
and then decide if they should really be applied to our game. So I'm going to go through five different rules here. I mean, kind of quote unquote rules, things that the industry talks about a lot, and talk about why I'm breaking these rules. So number one, the, you know, one of the things you hear a lot about is make it super social. The reason this rule exists is because social equals viral. And in an environment where you know, word of mouth by Facebook is what is making, really driving these games, um, viral really matters. Like if you want to get out to a big audience, this is what you can do without spending a lot of money. Um, but why we're breaking this rule, for this particular game, like you come in, um, it's, it, you know, it's not, on the surface this game is about exploration, but things go very strange from the very beginning and pretty soon you find yourself at the center of a conspiracy theory. Not you as an avatar, but you as you. Like you feel like you personally are the central character in this game. Um, and this is what's really special about the game. Like when we really designed and designed, we realized that this was the hidden gem. And when we started adding social, where you could do things like tweet, like, I'm blackmailing the government, or something like that, it just, it broke everything. The fiction just completely fell down. Um, and so we have a little bit of light social. You can do things like share your non-classified photos with your friends. But for the most part, we've cut the social out. Is this a bad idea? Well, I mean, I guess we'll know when we launch the game. But I think one of the, you know, what was important is that we, we decided whether this rule should really apply to us. Um, number two, a rule you should sort of, you know, a lot of these Facebook games, they say they kind of are designed around maximizing your time wasting potential. And yeah, this is important. Like we, the business model for a lot of these games is either pay or wait. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more on the next slide about why that rule exists. Um, but for this particular game, we wanted to make a game that just felt different. We wanted to make a game for busy people. Um, and you know, we, some of the rules that we're borrowing from, I come a little bit from uh, the movie industry. I spent a couple summers interning at Pixar, kind of thought that I'd end up there. And so we're sort of borrowing some of the rules that they have in their design process. I'm going to uh, save questions until the very end, just because I, I know I'm really tight on time. Um, and so one of the rules that we're working with, like when you design a movie, you sort of design with like, well, every line of dialogue should advance the story. You don't hear movie scriptwriters out there going like, you know, how can we add a couple hours of filler to the middle of this thing, right? It just, it'd make it for a terrible experience. Um, so we want to kind of just appeal to a little bit of a different audience. And this, is, this kind of ties into rule number three, which is sort of have two currencies. Like you hear all the time, the economic model is you need to have your two currencies. And the reason for this is that it allows for your time-rich cash-poor players to use the grind currency to sort of earn their coins by, by spending time, or your time-rich cash-poor players uh, I'm sorry, your time poor cash rich players to pay if they want to advance more quickly. Um, but for our particular game, uh, that doesn't work very well. We, we kind of, we played around with all different ways to add grind and we did a lot of brainstorming around this and every time we like started to implement a feature we were like, this makes the game a lot worse. It just breaks this fictional experience that we have. And so, so we got rid of the grind and we got rid of the grind currency. So we only have one currency. It's a hard currency and you use it to purchase items directly, basically. So, you know, another rule that we're breaking here. Um, another rule is that sort of this idea that um, the game should be designed for instant gratification. And this, I mean, it's very effective. It's the slot machine mechanic. Basically, instant gratification so satisfies our animal desire for a dopamine kick. And this works really well. Like Zynga, as much as Zynga has no interest in innovating, they're not going to go away because this kind of game is just is always going to appeal to people. Slot machines have not disappeared over time because people got bored with them, even though this is all you do. So why are we breaking this rule? We just want to, like we want our design process to appeal to a different sense for the, for the player. We want it to appeal to the, sense, to the player's sense of wonder rather than just trying to use addiction to keep the player coming back. Also, this increases suspense, works more within our fictional world, and just makes a more coherent fictional universe. So I felt compelled to throw in rule number five here. Um, I, I don't think this one's written down anywhere. No one really seems to talk about it, but it sure seems to be a rule that there should be cartoony, cartoony characters with huge heads. Um, why this rule exists is that it's approachable. And you know, a lot of these games that we're playing on Facebook sort of evolved out of kids' games, and it just, that standard just sort of stuck. So why are we breaking it? Number one, I am so over it. Number two, it's really condescending to your audience. And I think that you know, the audience, it, it was one thing when we were trying to reach out to like these 40-year-old housewives who had never played a game in their life and try to kind of bring them into the fold. But they have become a really sophisticated audience now. They're the ones who are now lobbying to like have a customer controlled exchange rate between your dual currencies. Like they really know what's up. They don't need cartoony characters with big heads to pull them into the world anymore. So why am I showing a picture of Ravenwood Fair here? 
Um, Brenda Brathwaite and John Romero, who I respect enormously, have been going around giving a talk talking about how they um, really kind of like pushed up the art level at Ravenwood Fair, and they described this as painterly. And I respect these developers enormously. This is not painterly. These are painterly. Bastion, Journey, Love, like these are games that are really pushing the art style, and I would love to see more stuff like this. So I think there are probably a few people out there who are pretty savvy who are saying, why are you talking about the rules of social games? The way that you describe Extrasolar is not a social game. It's an alternate reality game. And there's a lot of truth to that. We are borrowing heavily from the rules of alternate reality game design, but we're breaking those too. So I want to talk a little bit about those. The way that, like, so, the, so there are things that we like about alternate reality games. And this will, for those of you who aren't particularly familiar with the ARG genre, uh, this will get a little bit into that. Uh, alternate reality games, they, they tend to blur the line between fantasy and reality. They operate in real time, which is something different from us. So, so basically, like, you have these puzzles that are solved by an enormous group of people. The, the game starts on one, you know, one day, you have a small audience, and that audience ramps up. The difficulty of the puzzles ramps up, and everyone works together to solve these puzzles over time. It's a really compelling experience. Um, it's real time. It tends to take place through transmedia, so there's a lot of videos. There's voicemail messages. Like, it may take place in real space. Uh, maybe calls with your telephone are involved, text messages, and all that stuff is really cool because it's so immersive. Um, but ARGs also have a lot of flaws, uh, and, and so some of the things that we're breaking in the rules of ARG design are that we've taken, well, I mean, one of the things about ARGs is that they're very hard to monetize because of this way that they happen in real time. In general, when they've been done in the past, they tend to be, do, be done as a sort of an advertising campaign that sort of pays to just get people's attention. Uh, they don't have, they don't need to be sort of profit focused in and of themselves. So by making Exosolar single player, we've basically allowed it to be replayable, which is kind of nice. And also you can start from the beginning of the game at any time and not have to worry about having your group together to solve the games. You can play it, you play at your own pace. So we're hoping that breaking those sort of general rules of ARG design allows us to do something ARG-like and get that cool immersive experience without having, well, and also being able to monetize the process. So, uh, just a few other assumptions that didn't really fit into the rules, things that we're violating. Um, one, as I mentioned before, usually you play as an avatar, and in Ectosolar you play as yourself, so that's a little bit unusual. Um, also, usually there's a very clear delineation of where the game universe begins and ends, and in Ectosolar, because it takes place over the web, voicemail messages, video messages, and emails, that line is a little bit blurred. Uh, other things, uh, you know, some people think that when we design, we should really design around fun as an emotion, and we're like, this is so ingrained as us, in us as game developers that we sort of forget that like other art forms don't just target fun. I mean, some of the emotions that we're trying to get at are things like fear and suspense and anxiety, anxiety just because they're unusual and they're hard to achieve. I know that this seems weird, but using these emotions as design criteria has allowed us to kind of just try to push the space a little bit. It, you know, it's like, it's like when you, if you, somebody were to say, oh, I watched Schindler's List and it was terrible because it was just not fun. You would say, you're an uncultured swine, but you know, we, we, we sort of forget, like we, movies don't have to be, you know, have fun as their core criterion, and games don't either. So, and, and I'll mention some a little bit later that, are, that are, have already done a great job of violating that. Um, all right, so I touched on that. So other, you know, other game tropes that we're kind of getting away from are death, competition, score, winning and losing. Um, you know, those, again, those are important aspects of your toolbox, but feel free to leave them behind sometimes. So, okay, so I'm saying, you know, go out and break the rules, but how do you know which rules you should be breaking? And the, there's a kind of a process to that, and that process is basically iterative design. So it's okay to start with the rules, start with the things that people, like the collective wisdom of this community has learned about how to design a game, and how to, how to, you know, get, get your players and keep them coming back. But then iterate on that process and see what's really, like, get to that core of what's special about your game. So with our original design for Extrasolar, it was very social. We focused on exploration and sharing, and there was really very little story. But the more we sort of played around with it, we got a prototype out, we realized that that story was really what made this game cool. So we focused on that, and exploration kind of became just a tool for advancing that plot. Um, you know, one of the ways to, that you need to do this with, um, with iterative design is that you really need to get a playable prototype as soon as possible. It can be inc completely ugly. In fact, ugly is good because when you put that ugly prototype out to testers, my experience is that they focus on the gameplay. They, they focus on like the big picture. Whereas if you put a polished prototype out, they're like, can you shift this a couple pixels to the right or a couple pixels to the left? And they, they focus on the, the polish rather than the big picture. So it's okay to have that quick and dirty prototype. 
Uh, also, you know, oftentimes we spend a lot of time and energy coding and doing art for things that turn out to be bad ideas, and we need to be willing to throw those away in order to advance the whole design process. So this is kind of a little bit of an inverse of the, of the, of the list that I just had. Some of the common design fit, pitfalls are that we oftentimes spend a lot of time working on an engine and then just kind of throw in the gameplay at the very last second. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later when I get into my experiences with Pixar. Um, don't get entrenched on your first idea. It's okay to throw it out. Um, and don't forget to test on your noobs. You know, bring in, sometimes we, all we do is test on our own teams and we're all experts in what this game is and how to play it and, and you know, we have these assumptions that we've built up in our heads that, that a new player won't have. So, so it's important to test on them. Um, and also, you know, learn from more mature industries. Like as a art form, game development, like we're really young, so learn from more mature industries. Now I mentioned that I spent a little time at Pixar, so I want to go, this doesn't quite fit into this talk, but I feel like these are such gems of wisdom that I learned at Pixar that I feel like I want to go over them here. Lesson number one from Pixar is the Toy Story lesson. You know, Pixar came in as this, this young kind of startup and they had this new technology and they were focusing on making the world's first full, like feature length film that was entirely digital. And when Disney got hold of the story, they said, don't render another frame until you get the story right. Because while a few people may come to see this just because it's a digital film, you really need to have the story right for people to keep coming back. And so the lesson from that was that it takes, a great experience takes more than just great technology. And this is going back to the idea of don't spend all your time just working on your engine, but not the gameplay. You need to have other things more than just like a hook. You know, something new, you know, just a new art form isn't enough. Just a new mechanic isn't enough. You need to have great gameplay too. Lesson number two from Pixar was what I call the Incredibles lesson. And I remember, this was just around the time that I was leaving Pixar, and some of the writers on Pixar, uh, on Incredibles were saying, you know, I love this movie because people will come to see it because it's about superheroes, but they'll love it because it's about a family, and that's something that they can relate to. And so my lesson for that was, you know, what, what attracts an audience is not necessarily what keeps an audience. And for Extra Solar, the way that that works out is that I think what's going to bring people to the game is that it's about space exploration, but what's going to keep them coming back to the game is that they form these very personal relationships with these virtual characters that they're interacting with. Lesson number three from Pixar is what I call the up lesson, which is, for me, I'm about five minutes into the movie Up. I, has anyone not seen it yet? I'm about five minutes into the movie Up, and there have been about two lines of dialogue. The main character hasn't spoken at all, and I'm bawling my eyes out. And it's amazing. I mean, I think what, what I learned from this is that immersion means more than the time that you invest in the story. Um, you know, I think in the game industry, sometimes we claim that immersion just means spending a lot of time in a game. But you never hear anybody say like, oh my god, I was at the DMV for two hours this morning and it was so immersive. <laughs> right? So my claim is that immersion is an emotional connection to an experience that engages your mind. And so just, you know, just think about that when we're sort of designing to have our immersive games. So go forth and innovate, right? Right, okay. I, you know, I, I can give that as my little call out, but it's, it's a little harder to... To, to actually do that. So I'm going to give you some sort of practical rules to, to how, we can, how we can go out and sort of do exercises to, to actually try to improve our innovation in our games. Number one, and this is so easy, so easy, actionable lesson, leave your phone at home. Think about how many brilliant ideas you've had in the shower versus how many of your brilliant ideas you have while sitting in front of the computer. And then think about how much time you spend in the shower every day versus how much time you spend in, the, in front of the computer, right? Now, why is this? You know, why do our brilliant, brilliant ideas come from our unstructured time? Well, that innovation happens because we give our mind permission to wander. We don't have, we don't like feel the need to consume all the time. And when we leave, when we take our portable devices with us, every time we go out and we're like tweeting on, you know, on the, at the crosswalk, we're, we're turning our unstructured time into content consumption time. And I think that like this is really costing us something. Give, like make time in your day when your mind just has the freedom to wander. All right, exercise number two. To unconstrain your thinking, think with constraints. I know this sounds really counterintuitive. To unconstrain your thinking, think with constraints. This took me a long time to learn. Apparently, as it turns out, people in the art community, they've known this for a long time. So I'm going to pretend that you guys didn't know this already and relay it to you. Most of you probably already knew this. Um, you know, an easy way to do this, especially if you've been to a game jam, like, you, you know that, like, taking those, like, if you just, if I just put out a call to a room and say, hey, give me 100 different games, I end up with, like, 100 different first person, like, or, like, 100 different platformers, and they, they all look the same. But if I say, give me a game about, like, skinning a banana with an otter, then, like, I get 100 completely different games that I could never have imagined. 
So, so the way that you can kind of apply this lesson just as a thought process is to, is to start with an assumption that we sort of have about the game industry and then turn it on its head and see what you get out of it. So, so consider an assumption like this where like you see in the console industry like every generation of console has more and more buttons. So what if we take this assumption and say, let's just have one button. Now what kind of games would you get out of that? Well, you, you'd get something like Cannibal or Far Away. You know, there's a one button challenge that took place at GDC a few years ago and there were just hundreds of absolutely amazing games that come out of that. And none, no two of those games were, were, were even similar. Uh, so that was just a, like a really cool constraint to work with. Um, how about a, a constraint with fit from physics, like time moves forward? Well, what happens when you get rid of that? Well, maybe you get something like retrograde or braid. How about something like space is contiguous? Um, you know, you might get something like Portal or Where is My Heart? And, you know, this is like, this is a great example that these two games are like completely different and yet you can imagine them both coming from the same constraint of make a game where space is discontinuous. Um, you know, what I mentioned previously that sometimes we think that the key emotion has to be fun, but there are some amazing games out there like Dear Esther or Amnesia where the key emotion is definitely not fun. Um, and you know, you might think, if you don't know Dear Esther, like you might think from this picture that it's a horror, but it's not. It's kind of just like an experiential uh, game where you just kind of explore a world and, and sort of explore a story non-linearly. So it's very unusual. Um, how about a really core assumption about video games is that there has to be a screen? Well, you know, if you get rid of that, you get something like Johann Sebastian Joust. And, and you know, with a game like this, is this even a video game? You know, I don't know. Does this belong in our industry? I don't know, but I'm certainly proud to have it. Um, and what's important is that, you know, this kind of game completely changes our notions about what a game can be. So when you're doing your design process, I want you to think about what your constraints are. Think about what your shortcomings are and how you can use those to your strengths and, and work around them to your advantage. Um, and of course, you know, look at what your strengths are and your, your unusual background. Like, what do you bring to the picture that another game developer might not have? Um, and this brings me to exercise three, which is so simple, which is just be inspired. We all spend a lot of time doing this, and this is really important, like going out and seeing what other people are playing, what, what other people are making and playing those games and sort of understanding those, those new experiences. That's really important for, for expanding our understanding of what a game can be. But we also need to go out and be inspired by this, and this, and this, and this. And when you're done, you know, keep in mind, remember, this is, this is not just our toolbox, but this is our set of assumptions. And if you're doing things right, when you're done, this should be forever changed, not just for you, but for everyone in the industry. Thank you for your time. And it looks like I have about four minutes for questions, and uh, if people can ask questions. To the mic here, which I'll try to pass around. If you want to come to the front here and ask. Yeah, if people can just come to the front so you can kind of pass the mic, that'd be perfect. Just so we can get it all, all recorded and everybody can hear you. Greetings, sir. I'm also giving a presentation on innovation this afternoon, 2 p.m. in Crystal, so I was curious. So, if we are not building for fun as the, as the core emotion, what, uh, what is your preferred emotion? I think using not fun as a constraint, um, I mean, I shouldn't say not fun, but <laughs> um, I think that deliberately saying, let's leave fun behind and see what happens. Is, is simply an interesting constraint to go with. Um, you know, I, and I admit I had a couple of conflicting slides in here because I, one of the things that I talked about that I hate with, with monetization is that uh, currently you, you see things like Farmville that leverage social guilt as sort of a monetization factor. And we're also trying to target guilt as an emotion, but in a very diff different way. Um, the, the way that Farmville targets guilt is that if you leave the game, you feel guilty because your crops wither and everyone can see that. For us, we're actually trying to add guilt in, into the game in a way that if you keep playing, you feel guilty for some of the actions and the consequences of those actions. So the only way to stop that guilt is to stop playing. So it's, it's, it's exactly the opposite of the way that guilt is being used in Farmville. Um, are people going to like that? Are people going to stop playing? I don't know, but we're certainly having a fun time writing the story around it. Similar question. Have you played Spec Ops The Line? I have not yet. Okay. Well, check it out and maybe you'll Feel some, you'll feel inspired. Do you, is there a key emotion there that you think it's hitting on? Um, you are the, it, 
According to the Zero Punctuation Review, you are the only sane man in the voice of the main character. Sorry, you are the only sane man who's the, who's a... If you were an alternate... Sorry, if you were a voice in someone's head and they were doing horrible things, you would be the, stop it, you're doing it wrong, you're, you're basically killing your friends. What are you doing? So, so, so sort of the guilt thing. You feel guilty for doing, for just playing. I think so. Yeah. Anyone else want to stab at this? Here you go. So in uh, some of the, the assumptions you were questioning in regards to ARGs, uh, I noticed were things that were done previously by uh, an EA game called Majestic. Yes. Uh, have you guys taken a lot of look at like what worked for that, what didn't work for that? Because I know that was kind of a flop for EA, but it, I, I personally liked that game a lot. I thought it was a really interesting experience. This is very consistent with what you hear about ARGs, is that the players love them, and they are an absolutely amazing experience. Um, some of you may know that uh, Portal 2 launched with an alternate reality game experience that, I, that actually I worked on. Um, and, and they're great, but like you said, like, they're very hard to monetize because the, uh, they're, lin they're very expensive to create, they're linear, they have to happen in real time, and when they're done, there's zero replay value, so you can't have other customers come in and play it. So, so I agree. I th I'm totally on board with you. The customers love them, but we need to find a way to make that experience monetizable. Do you have some ideas on that? I think that what we're doing with Extra Solar, with making it a single player experience, making it so you can come in and play at your own pace, you can play at any time, uh, we're hoping that those get those cool emotions that you get with playing as an ARG, uh, but allow us to, to sort of fix some of the problems with the ARG. So and there, there are lots of ARGs to choose from. There's, there's The Beast, which was one of the first ones, was put on by Microsoft in, uh, along with the release of AI the movie. There was uh, Majestic that you mentioned. I Love Bees was with, a, with the launch of Halo. Um, so the good news is there's a lot of wisdom to draw from out there. Uh, are you just planning on then, uh, since story is the main selling point, and that's what you're monetizing is your story, essentially, are you planning on then moving to like DLC or like expansion packs to that story, essentially? It was basically organized in, in three different seasons. So we're currently writing season one, if it's any good, and you know, if it's a success, we'll hopefully go on to seasons two and three. Um, but basically, it's important for me that the game is, in, is, is free to play from beginning to end without having to like spam your friends or anything. Um, and you will basically pay for just for extras. Thank you. Yep. It's actually, I'll go ahead and take one more question, but I, if there's a speaker who's getting ready to, uh, to present next, go ahead and start hooking up your computer. Uh, you mentioned I Love Bees. In I Love Bees, uh, there was a point where the players kind of turned the game creator's expectations on their head. When they were supposed to protect the princess, and instead they revealed her to the uh, enemy. I forget the name of it. It's been a while. Uh, but do you think that by creating a single-player game instead of a collaborative multiplayer experience, you have less trouble having to constantly be on the ball and rewriting material to meet what players have done? We hope so. We, we definitely appreciate having a little bit more control over the experience. But I think you touched on something interesting about ARGs, and we're also really turning the players' expectations on their head from the very get-go, and this is a little bit of a mini spoiler, but from the very f first experience with the game, like, we throw a wrench into things. And in fact, you actually get rejected from the program when you apply. And every alpha tester that we've put this out to has emailed me and said, hey, your system's down. And then five minutes later, they email me and say, fuck you. <laughs> uh, so what happens when we put this out to hundreds of thousands of people? We have no idea, but, but we're, we're, we're also sort of really trying to break people's expectations of what the game is going to be from the very first instant. Thank you. All right. Thanks for your time.